good morning. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Jess. Um, I work for Phase Trust, which is connected to Life Central, but also been a part of this church here at Hales Owen for about three years now. So it's so great to be sharing with you this morning. And as you can see on the, on the screen, the title of this talk is Push Through the Crowd. And that's going to make sense a little bit more later on. Um, but also on the screen, if you have a look, there should be a picture. And this is of me with my husband Jack and our family. This was taken in Cornwall this year in a place called Port Isaac. And it's kind of become a tradition that we go on holiday every year to Cornwall now. We just love it that much. And we spend our time going on walks, eating ice cream, time on the beach. And it's always just amazing. And they also, obviously, we have to have... Cornish passes when we're there and if you're gluten-free this morning like me let me tell you they do the best gluten-free pasties in Cornwall so if you head there you've got to try one and honestly it's like a week of being in heaven for me because I can eat as many pasties as I want and not get ill so it's great but one thing you need to know about Jack's family is they love an adventure and they would probably laugh at me for thinking that what I'm about to tell you was an adventure um, but last year somebody had the idea why don't we climb down one of the cliff edges get into the sea and swim back to shore and everybody was so happy to do this so excited yeah let's give it a go what a great thing to do apart from me who has let's say a love-hate relationship with the sea sometimes I think it's amazing it's refreshing relaxing other times I start to think about how tiny I am and how huge the sea is and all the different creatures that are in the sea that I don't have a clue about and where does it even end and I just start to freak out in my mind. I'm even freaking out now thinking about it but I couldn't say this because it would make me seem like a weirdo and this is when we were engaged so I had to be on board with the family. Um, so I get in the sea and we start swimming and I'm actually doing really well until... I think, oh, let's see how far I've come. And I realize that I am in the middle of the sea. Slight exaggeration, but I feel like I'm in the middle of the sea because there is no cliff edges around me to hold on to. And I just start to panic. I mean, panic like I've never panicked before. And I started to scream. I was like, Jack, Jack, you've got to get me out of here. You've got to get me out of the sea. And he was like, Jess, we're in the middle of the sea. What do you want me to do? I was like, I don't care. You've got to get me out. So I'm clinging on his neck and he's dragging me to the cliff edge. And I scramble up faster than I've ever climbed anything before and collapse at the top in a heap of embarrassment. And, you know, now it's a funny story that we look back on as a family. In fact, this year, they actually brought a clip on float for me whilst we're in the sea. And yes, I did use it. Um, I'm not ashamed to say. Um, but in the moment, that panic was real. That overwhelming feeling of my surroundings being so much bigger than me was real. And you may not have been stuck in the middle of the sea like me. But I'm sure you can relate to when the pressures of life just feel so overwhelming and we feel so tiny in comparison. I read um, a statistic the other day that said um, that 74% of adults said they had moments of feeling overwhelmed or unable to cope in the last year. And that to me is staggering. That to me says that this is something we need to be talking about. I remember being on a youth weekend away a couple of years back and on this youth weekend away there was a boy named Jacob and his name got repeated a lot by the leaders but not for a good reason. He was the troublemaker, he was the one that kind of thought he was the big man and in the middle of the meetings would make it really obvious that he really didn't like Jesus and what we were saying. Um, and in the talk that I was doing I remember God speaking to me about Jacob and this wasn't a booming voice it was almost just these thoughts that I couldn't get rid of that I knew wasn't from me and I felt like God say Jess Jacob was rejected at a very young age and there's something that's happened in his life that he blames himself for that was never his fault 
And that is why he can't relate to me because he doesn't understand how a God could love and accept him when nobody has before. So I took a moment and I decided I wasn't brave enough to say his name, but I shared that and I said, somebody in this room is feeling this. And at the end of the talk, Jacob came up to me and at first was a bit aggressive and was like, how do you know all that? Who's been talking to you? Who's been telling you about me? And I said, Jacob, I've not spoken to any of the leaders about you. I said, I believe that was God that told me about you. And he kind of looked at me in shock. And I said, and, you know, God knows exactly what you've been through. And he started to share with me his story about how his mum had actually abandoned him on his dad's doorstep at five years old. And he'd never seen her since that moment. And how his dad had really struggled with mental illnesses and had quite often told him that it was his fault. So he'd carried that blame. And for Jacob, it was a feeling of rejection that was overwhelming him. And I don't know what that feeling is for you this morning. I don't know what situations are overwhelming you. Maybe it's the situation at work that just doesn't seem to be getting any better. Maybe it's that relationship that you hope and pray will be restored, but it just seems impossible. Or maybe for you, you are consumed by the stress that you are facing every single day and it's too much to handle. You see, the statistics say one thing about being overwhelmed. But we have a God who isn't defined by statistics. And we have a God who knows every single situation that you're going through and who wants to break through into those situations. So I'm actually going to pray right now for those of you who are feeling overwhelmed that God would speak to you in the rest of this talk. So why don't we close our eyes? Let's pray. God, I pray that whatever situation people are facing right now, that they would hear you speaking to them. God, that you would calm the feeling of being overwhelmed even just for half an hour to hear your voice this morning. And that those that maybe don't know you yet or feel far away from you, that they would be open to, to knowing more about you. That they would realize that actually we don't need to be perfect before we come to you, but that you care about every single detail in our lives, even the imperfect ones. God, would you change lives this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to look at um, a letter this morning that was written by a guy named Peter. And let me just tell you who Peter is in case you don't know. Peter met Jesus when he was a young adult. He traveled around with Jesus for three years. And he was one of Jesus' closest friends. And even though he was one of Jesus' closest friends, he still had his ups and downs with Jesus. And one of those uh, low moments for Peter was just before uh, Jesus was about to die and he's been on trial for his death and some people who are against Jesus come to Peter and ask him about his relationship with Jesus and in that moment even as Jesus's closest friend he denies him and I don't mean just a shrug of the shoulders oh I don't know what you're talking about I mean outright three times denies Jesus swears he's never even met the man Jesus's closest friend yet Three days later, when Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus came to Peter and he asked Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? Knowing what had happened. And it's this beautiful moment of restoration of Peter to Jesus and Jesus accepting Peter and understanding what he's done. And Peter says in this moment, Jesus, you know I love you and I want to live the rest of my life for you. And that's what he goes on to do. He goes to start the early church and now he is writing to a group of people who are experiencing persecution for their faith, who have been scattered out because of believing in Jesus. And we're jumping in at the end of this letter here, and it's in 1 Peter 5, and it says, So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Peter is writing to a group that are experiencing persecution, and this is all he has to say. 
I mean, if I was one of those people, I think I'd be stood there going, Peter, are you kidding me? How insensitive do you want to be? You're telling me to humble myself. Why don't you go and tell those that are persecuting us to humble themselves? We're already the lowest of the low. And pray about it. We're not stupid. Of course we've been praying. Tell us something that we don't know. Tell us when this is going to end. But he doesn't. This is what he says. And I think sometimes we can have this same dialogue in our head. We hear talks about being overwhelmed and praying about things, but we look at our life and we realize it's so difficult and it's just not that easy. But I think what happens sometimes is we take verses like this and we take it out of context and actually they end up not being very helpful. So I want us to look again at maybe what Peter is saying in this verse. What if we are missing what he is trying to say? Because you see, we live in a society now that we say we're more connected than ever, yet we're more isolated than ever, really. When we have a problem, we keep it to ourselves because if it's my problem, it's my problem to fix. And we're told in order to be happy, we've got to look out for number one, which is ourselves. And I don't think that this way of living is actually helpful when it comes to the topic of being overwhelmed. Because it makes us feel like this is all on us to do on our own. But let's remember, Peter is writing not to an individual, but to a group of people here. So let's have another look at what he's saying. So, humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. Just before this verse, Peter talks about how we should be humble in how we relate to each other. And someone once said, being humble isn't thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. In other words, it's not putting yourself down, but it's looking out for those around you. And more importantly, it's remembering who God is, that God is above it all. That no matter what the situations are, that actually we are under his mighty power. We are protected by that if we believe in Jesus this morning. It goes on to say, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. God always honors those whose hearts are for him. He notices us even in the difficult times. And this is hope for them, but also for us, that actually there will be a time that we're lifted out of this situation that we're facing. Give all your worries and cares to God. Peter is saying here, now that we are humble towards each other, now we're looking out for each other, now that we're remembering who God is, that he is mighty and above it all, Now let's give our worries and cares to God. And not on our own, but together. We're meant to do this together. Because sometimes actually carrying those worries and cares to God is too much for us to do. And sometimes we need to be able to say, I can't, but we can. You see, we were never meant to do this life alone. From the beginning of time, when God created man, he said it's not good for man to be alone, so he created Eve, a partner to do life with. So when we're feeling overwhelmed and when the stress is all too much in our minds, we can together look at this verse and know that together we can carry our worries and cares to God. Because I don't know about you, but when I keep stuff inside, it kind of goes round and round in my head and I don't seem to get anywhere. But actually, when I speak things out, something is released. And when we allow those around us to speak truth into our darkness, it brings freedom. We need to say sometimes, I can't, but we can. We're going to have a look at another story in the Bible that um, is written in Luke. And it should come up on the screen. Amazing. And and it says this. One day, while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. I think that's just like a little tag on to have a dig at the people that don't like Jesus that are turning up all the time. Just like they seem to turn up everywhere. Um, Anyway, and the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. 
They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd, right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, Young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, Who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And immediately, as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat and went home praising God. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe and they praised God exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. You see, if it wasn't for these friends, I wonder if this man would have ever got to Jesus. It actually took those people looking around and noticing somebody in need and doing what they could to help him push through the crowd. And for this paralyzed man, it was a physical barrier between him and Jesus. The crowd was in between him and he had no way of pushing through. But for us, I think sometimes this barrier between us and Jesus is this feeling of being overwhelmed. That Actually, when we feel like that, dare I say it, we don't feel like praying sometimes. And I think it's in those moments that we need to reach out to people around us and say, I need you to help me push through this crowd and get to Jesus. When I was thinking about this, I thought back to the bike ride that I did in May. And um, it does make sense. I'm not just showing off. Uh, but here I am uh, in my little helmet looking as great as ever. And this was the bike ride that Faze trusted along with some friends to raise money for the work that we do. And we cycled all the way from Wales uh, back to Hales Owen. And it was 106 miles. Um, and I'm not a cyclist. But anyway, it somehow happened. And it was an event ride, lots of ups and downs, literally. Um, and on this ride, one thing that we would do is um, when we were feeling tired, we would do this thing called a pace sign. And if you're not a cyclist today, I'm going to teach you a little bit. And basically what would happen is we would get in a line and we would all cycle really closely to each other. And the idea being that the person in front um, pushes against the wind and breaks that so that everybody else is protected by that. And you're almost dragged along by the person in front of you. And this was a great way to get your energy back and we do this quite often and honestly if we hadn't have done this I wouldn't have finished this bike ride but the thing is in order to make this work in order for this to be effective it took the person in front admitting when he was tired and when somebody else needed to take over it took the paralyzed man in this story admitting that he needed help I mean, imagine how he felt. It says he was laid on a mat, helpless, looking at this crowd between him and Jesus, the one who he knows could change everything. He had two options in that moment. One, he could have stayed on the mat and just prayed and hoped that the crowd would go away and that Jesus would notice him a bit later on. Or two, he could be brave enough to be vulnerable and to ask for others to help him get to Jesus. And I think sometimes we need to allow ourselves, just like that man, to be vulnerable. To say, you know what, I'm actually not doing okay. Not just do the polite British thing that we do where we're like, oh, hi, you're right. Yeah, yeah, are you? Yeah, plodding on. Like, not just to say that, but to actually speak to those who we're connected with and say, you know what, I'm not doing okay. You know what, please do make that meal for me and my family this week because we're really struggling. Or, you know what, please do help me go and get the help that I need from some professionals. It takes us being vulnerable with each other and saying, I can't, but we can. 
And I know that this isn't easy to do. There's been times in my life where I've had to admit to people that I'm not doing okay and that I need support. And I'm so blessed to say that I'm in a church where I know when I say that, that people will support me. And to have friends who I know when I say, will you pray for me or can we meet up for a coffee? I need to get some stuff off my chest, that they will do that for me. And actually, I've got a friend called Beth who doesn't live around here. And we FaceTime every week and just catch up about how, how our weeks have been and ask what we can be praying for for each other. And I know when I say to Beth, I need you to be praying about this, that she flipping prays for it. In fact, I got a notebook through the post a couple of weeks ago that was actually filled um, with prayers that she'd prayed for me over the past year every single day. And I was like, oh my word, I'm an awful friend. I would never do something like that. (laughs) But I don't tell you this to say, look how amazing my friends are. I tell you this because we all need people in our lives to do this for us. And actually, if you feel like you don't have those people, I really encourage you to speak to someone on the team this morning because we have connect groups here at this church and that is a great place to be able to do that. So please do let us help you with that this morning. But actually, I also share this because I think that we need to be people like that as well. We need to be the ones when people call us up and say, can we go for a coffee? I'm struggling. That actually we're there. We need to be the ones when people say, will you pray about this? Actually, we do pray about that. Because I can't, but we can. And the last bit of this verse, which is so important for us to grab, is for he cares for you. Jesus, in this story, cared about this man. He knew exactly what this man was going through. And he didn't just see the physical things that everybody else saw that he needed healing. He saw his heart. It says in that verse that he says, your sins are forgiven. He saw that this man was carrying things that he shouldn't have been carrying and that he needed to know God's love. And he sees you as well this morning. At the beginning, I shared with you about Jacob who was feeling overwhelmed by this feeling of rejection and I'm so pleased to say that that's not where it ended for Jacob. After he had told me his story he sat there with tears in his eyes and I sat there crying too listening to the heartbreak that he'd been through and he turned to me and he said to me Jess I need Jesus and there and then he asked Jesus to come into his life and he said, Jesus, I want to follow you. And it was this amazing moment where actually Jesus broke that feeling of rejection that he'd been carrying his whole life. You see, it didn't have to end there for Jacob and it doesn't have to end there for you. I want to invite the band up. Thank you. Today, I hope that you've grasped that we're not meant to do this life on our own. That actually when things are overwhelming, when life feels too much, that we can reach out to people around us and say, together will you carry these worries to God with me? Together will you stand with me and pray about this until I see something change? And that is so, so important for us to do and for us to be those people for others around us as well. But more importantly, what I want you to get this morning is that I can't, but he can. He can. He can restore that relationship that has been broken for so long that you think is beyond fixing. He can bring that person back to him who you've been praying for for years and years and you think there's no hope anymore. He can bring them back. He can speak into that stress that is consuming your mind every single day and he can bring peace. It says in the Bible that Jesus spoke one word and it calmed the storm and he can do that for you this morning as well. He can break those chains of addiction, maybe that addiction that nobody even knows you're struggling with. He can break that this morning. And actually, I feel like there's somebody in here today who you've actually received news news this morning, this very morning before you came to church, about a situation in your family. 
and it has left you feeling overwhelmed and knowing how on earth is this going to change. And I feel like God wants you to know this morning that he sees that and that it is going to change. And that you need to repeat over yourself every morning, I can't, but he can. And if you relate to this feeling of being overwhelmed, I'm going to pray for you in a moment. But before I do, I want to speak to another group of people in the room. And maybe that's those who don't yet know Jesus who like Jacob have listened this morning and listened to the kind of person that Jesus is and has gone, you know what, I need Jesus. Or maybe it's that you knew Jesus, but you're disconnected at the moment and you've realized, Jesus, I need you again. And what's going to happen is I'm going to ask everyone to close their eyes in a moment and if that's you, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And that is a sign for you, really, to know that this isn't just something you're thinking, but this is something you mean. And then I'm going to pray a prayer. And in this prayer, it's going to say, Jesus, I choose to follow you today. I'm sorry for living life my own way. But God, I thank you that Jesus died and he rose again so that I could be forgiven and so that I can have a relationship with you. Jesus, I thank you that you love me and I want to live my life following you.